This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic, episode 29. Wow, 29 episodes. Today's question, if you were at the top of your game, would you ever consider retiring? Well, that's exactly what Lisa Lampanelli did. Hey guys, welcome to the classroom of life that is Stand Up where every show I do my best to fight apathy and ignorance and learn together with you from our expert guests and other interesting people about the issues and ideas that matter to you, your family, your community, country, and planet, including your own personal well-being, dealing with loss, health issues, depression, anxiety, just trying to evolve into being a better you or just being the best you. So let's do it, shall we? My guest today is Lisa Lampanelli who announced a retirement from stand-up comedy on the Howard Stern radio show on Sirius XM back in late 2018. And now she's dedicating her life to, well, whatever she wants, including running these transformational food and body image workshops, performing an issue-oriented storytelling shows, and completing a rigorous life coaching certification program. You got to check out Lisa Lampanelli's Losing It, which is her show she's on tour with now. Lisa and I go way back. I opened for her at the beginning of my career, and I guess at the middle of hers, but she went on to become a massive, massive stand-up comic. She was on the Comedy Central roasts. She did a whole bunch of stand-up specials, and she sold out theaters all over the country for years. She had a great reputation for being a really generous person and comedian, and she certainly was that to me. We've remained friends. We talked on and off over the years. She joined me on the radio show. And a couple of days ago, we had this amazing conversation you're about to hear. Two episodes ago, or three now, I guess, I welcomed Wajahat Ali, and I came out and was honest about the struggle I've been dealing with, anxiety and depression, after losing my dream job at Sirius XM. And the reaction to that was overwhelmingly positive, nothing but positive. And I thought, well, I should do more of that. I was going to keep it more private and wait to talk about it and write about it and think about it until after, you know, hopefully it was over, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. But I realized how much people loved it and how I thought being honest was the best idea for me. I didn't want to depress anybody. I don't want to depress anybody any more than you might already be with different circumstances in your life. I want to lift people up. And I realize that if I share my story while I'm going through it, maybe we can help each other. So that's what I did with Lisa. It might sound a little bit like therapy in this conversation at times, and I don't want it to be about me and my struggle alone. I know so many of you are dealing with these issues or have dealt with them in the past. So that's what I hope this conversation is to you. It was really enlightening and inspiring and funny. We had a great conversation. Don't forget... Sign up on the Patreon. Be a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. That's what funds this show. Able, enables me to do it. Ables me to do it. Enables me to do it. Allows me to do it three times a week. And give it a rating on iTunes. Five stars. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And I'll be in Charleston, South Carolina, January 18th at the Charleston Comedy Festival. So check me out there, please. Get tickets now. And without further ado, my conversation with the legend the former queen of mean, Lisa Lampanelli. Yeah, it's so much better than a landline because FaceTime, and maybe you should use this more. Yeah. Because FaceTime is on your Wi-Fi. It's so basically, I just figured out through you a way to actually use this phone at home because I literally cannot use this phone at home. So I think now it's I can. Hilarious that you have a million dollar home and you're without um, a phone connection. I think it's hilarious that you think my home's only one million. I just saw I Google news you, and it said like the thing <laughs> the things that picked that it that it picked up were that you you put your home on the market. Yes, yes, for, for like and two million, I guess. What is it? I, I would say two point four, but it may uh, it may come down. <laughs> Why are you moving? I left. I left. I always left because we fucking. It always ends up money with me and you somehow. Does it really? Oh, I feel no. Bad. It's funny. It's funny, dude. Um, no, I decided to sell. It's too big. And plus, do I really want to flush that much money down the toilet? I'm so freaking. You know, since I retired from stand up, everything's like less is more. Sure. And I'm like, I'm wasting so much money. And it just feels stupid. I know everything I did this past year just feels like I, I got a down, downsize, downsize, downsize. Stop it already. 
Can I use this? I pressed record like a minute ago. God, yeah. Okay. Uh, because, dude, I literally have been doing nothing. And my whole goal, I don't make resolutions because they're bullshit. I literally have resolved in the past few months to go, I'm not saying yes to anything that in a good, in a positive way, mm -hmm. because saying, saying yes to anything that has to do with achievement is really just not healthy for me. It's just another freaking addiction and another thing to numb. It's like, Oh, that'll make me feel good. If I'm a good motivational speaker, or that'll make me feel good. If I have clients as a coach, or if I do, um, tons of, you know, different workshops or whatever. And I'm like, how about you just learn how to be and just be a human and then see where that goes. And maybe you'll figure out what you're really supposed to be doing with your life. You have, so, a, you, you have evolved more than almost any person I know. You like your every day. There seems to be really interesting, positive growth in, in, in ways that most people probably never make. Well, yeah. Well, the problem was what I, I realized what I did over the past year was after I retired publicly from stand up, which was super healthy and positive, I was like, OK, frying pan, meet fire and just jumped into something else. It's like going from a relationship mm. with one guy into another. And I should have taken a year to just kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life and be alone and be like, um, really lean into just the unknowing, but as comics and performers and driven people, I don't think we give ourselves time to just be, and I'm like, Oh, guess what? 2020 is going to be, excuse me, 2020 is going to be just me being and figuring out sort of naturally what to do. But yeah, dude, I got to like, I'm 58. It's like, I better be more involved than most people you met because I got to make sure I have a decent life. Are you making like tea or something? There's a lot of noise. No, I'm not. Mm. I'm putting on makeup. Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. I have to go to my sister's for New Year, so I'll, I'll put on makeup more quietly. How much, As you time, get old, how much time can I, I talk to you for? Like an hour, but awesome. that's probably too that's probably too much for you. You're no. probably like, who the fuck wants to talk to you for an hour? I do. Uh, I'll stop making I'll stop making tea out of my makeup because that's like my new secret. So what is your relationship or thoughts about self-compassion, like allowing yourself? Because you said I have I, I should have taken a year. Yes. Like, I feel like I feel like that you 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 make there's so much improvement all the time, so much growth. You take steps forward. We take steps back. But do you kind of forgive yourself and have compassion yes. for yourself? Do you have a relationship with that phrase? I'm new to it. Self-compassion. No, I love it, because guess what? Thank God I did exactly what I did. Jump from one thing to another, not like the things I was doing, and then go, oh, well, if I didn't try it, I wouldn't be where I am now. Mm -hmm. And that's like literally the, I never used to buy into the no regrets and hey, I had to have failures to figure out who I am. It's like, I learned so much from, you know, not liking different things over the past year that I'm like, holy crap, thank God I did it. So that's why I'm not like, beating myself up and going, why didn't I do that? That was so stupid. It wasn't stupid. It was super smart to just be in tune and learn from it. But I, I saw this interview that you did, I think with Ron Bennington, where you were kind of uh, bashing like hobbies and, and interests. Oh, and it right. was interesting because what you said then sounds a little bit differently than what you, what you're yes. saying now, it, what you said then was, you know, if I ever take up woodworking, kill me because right. you said, I just want to work. And then you said, I, I, I went back to my piano and I was like, this is nonsense. So, so is, is something changed since you, you know, gave him that answer in terms of just being or, or being able to yes. relax or be what? Yeah. hundred percent. Like I literally now I'm like, whatever, I float over to like, meaning like I have a piano, I take ballroom dance lessons, like whatever I go to that cool. feels like, Oh, I'm going to give that a try. Oh, that sounds cute or whatever. And then by the way, I have to focus on not making it an achievement. So I have to literally take up uh, if I take up a hobby, cause I took up ballroom dancing. Suddenly I was like doing competitions. I'm like, Jesus Christ, could you just enjoy something for a minute? Um, so yeah, the, um, what's that about the, what's the, uh, achievement thing about like making a hobby, 
a, a competition where you have to win a trophy or have it be some goal that you have to accomplish? What is that? Because I think if you're raised that you, and I'm sure you're like this because, you know, you're a comic and you need that immediate hit of, you know, uh, look, mommy, I'm good. So I think we, we get applause when we're kids from teachers, from parents, from aunts, uncles, anyone around us and going, oh my God, look at what you did. Oh my God, that's so great. So if you're getting that hit of opium of achievement, even if it's a little thing like a drawing or a, like a, it starts a hobby and then all of a sudden, isn't he the best? And you just have to keep up this whole thing of like, my whole life now is achievement because that's my hit I got as a kid. And you don't even question it because other people uh, wrap it up as, but it's great to have goals and great to achieve things. Yeah, but not at the expense of having a life and also being like an addiction and numbing. So the minute my comedy or my career or my, it could be animal rescue. It could be ballroom dancing. It could be painting or piano. The minute it tips into oh, I'm using it to numb or as a distraction or as getting my self-worth from that, then that's not healthy. I just want to do it like, cause it's cute and fun. And it might be like a little thing that adds some little thing to my life. But yeah, I'm saying I promised my shrink. Uh, that's why this year has been so much growth. Cause I got the best, smartest shrink in the world because I can talk my way around any shrink except her. Mm. She's such a badass. And she, I told her, I promise you 2000, excuse me, 2020, is absolutely no to anything that stinks of achievement. So basically I'm saying yes to only things and taking it only as far as that goes. How's that going? Well, it started today because 2020 started today. So shut your fucking mouth. That's Stop awesome. being such a, <laughs> no, no, no. What is it? it's, going, it's going better. Cause I'll tell you what I, I, I had it drummed into my head because I was offered a play and it was only one day, but three weeks of equity rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And honestly, Pete, I sobbed every day because I was so miserable mm. because I hate, I hated that somebody else's was in charge of my time. And like, I just took it so I could say I did a play and, you know, I, and yes, it was good to discover that I can't act if I want to. How about that? I freaking hate it. Like, no. So what that was a hard lesson in going, okay, now 2020 is literally only for stuff that feels right and not achieving. But so it, it is going pretty good. I did vow it already. But it seems like you do have uh, an agenda. I mean, your, your storytelling series, Losing It, which everybody can see you in, in Ohio and uh, on January 9th and 10th, and then you head out to uh, Arizona, and then you're going to Des Moines, Iowa and Texas, Lisa Lampanelli.com. First of all, what is losing? Well, it? yeah. First of all, I'll tell you how that separates and, and really folds into the achieving part of it. Uh, that storytelling show was one of the only things that I was driven to do purely out of message to the public. So it's basically a really funny, but very heartfelt storytelling show uh, about food and body image and weight, uh, uh, issues and things like that. That was literally, there's no achievement associated with, Hey, I'm doing a storytelling show. Like it's almost, it's like I, I was driven to do stand up cause I wanted to be so funny and seen and heard. And this one has 99%. It's about the audience feeling better about themselves once they leave. So there really isn't a lot of achievement attached because also these shows don't pay very much. So you can't judge your worth by money. Um, so what's great about it, I go, oh, I can fulfill my obligations to do that show until the end of next June and then go, OK, let me see how it feels for that six months to just do something that's message oriented for other people and doesn't sort of give my ego that hit of like, look at me, I'm still in a spotlight. It's like it's this weird line I have to do because I find myself getting lost in it and into fame or how many followers or how many tickets sold. And I just go insane. Like I judge myself too harshly. And um, this hopefully will just feed into the giving something of love to people that need it. Let's go way back and uh, talk about just quickly. You know, I've, I've known you for probably 20 years. I used to open for you. 
at doing comedy all over the place. And both of us have obviously changed a lot in those 20 years, but you became super famous, super wealthy, uh, super successful by every measure. And then you retired from comedy on the Howard Stern show, like a very public retirement. What nobody ever does that. Uh, nobody ever does that in comedy. And, yeah. and, and yeah. certainly not the way that you did it. What brought you to that point? And, and, and before you even answer that last night, I was doing a gig with some comedians and I was talking that uh, about you that I, I had, I was going to be interviewing you today and, and people, we were all saying, I wonder if, if she, saw the writing on the wall in terms of what she was doing on stage with, with the way that things have changed and political correctness and the way that she was this insult comic and talking about race and sexuality, even though she was always on the right side of it, maybe she thought, well, I can't continue to get away with that. So I'm, I'm going to retire, but I don't, is there any truth to that? No. And the thing is, I've uh, answered that question so many times and I don't blame people if they go, yeah, I bet it was a little part part of it because I was still killing with that same type of humor well into 2018. Right. So I didn't care. Like my audience was still my audience. They loved me. I had no problem with it. The sneaking thing that I had, it, the only thing inside, I didn't care what I could get away with because I could get away with it because of being loving and insult comedy coming from the right place. But I also felt like I didn't want to contribute um, more bad language. I don't mean cursing, but I mean any kind of like stereotype stuff to the world anymore. Uh. Cause why, why bother? But that wasn't why that was a good, that was a good side benefit of getting out is that now the world has one less comic who says, you know, uh, uh whatever racial slur or whatever. So that's a side benefit. The big thing was when you find, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, when you find that you don't get the same joy out of something, like, why bother? It just didn't have the joy. Why? And shouldn't just, it's hard. It's lonely. It's not fulfilling. And you, I think I had this revelation that it's not fill in the hole. And all this achievement and comedy and being driven is not filling the hole. And the only thing that's going to fill the hole is connection, which is connection to real people connection to home, connection to nature, connection to spirit, connection to service, connection to um, meaningful work. And it didn't feel meaningful anymore. So what I'm doing now is so meaningful, but it's so minor a part of my life. It's like 20% of my life that I go, oh, it's in, getting in balance. So, so when you yeah, say connection to, to real people, like you always had a, a, an off, seemingly, as far as I could tell, even when I started with you. You, you, I remember you, you were so smart. You were always so business minded. You came from the business world. You, you were so smart to start this email, you know, this list mailing list before I think there right. even was email. And, and so my guess is that you did have a strong and authentic connection to your fans. Did you not? No, when you say no, real I, people. I don't, no, I don't think you can be friends with fans. I don't, I mm. don't buy that in the least. And I think it's always an unequal thing. It's like dating someone who's at a different income level. It's really hard. Like, you know, I married guys who didn't have money at all, and then you end up resentful. So the fact is, I think connecting with real people to me meant neighbors, real going to all the holidays with family and not being on the road, having a New Year's Eve where it's actually friends who you go, oh my God, I have deep, meaningful conversations with you. When I was obsessed with being a comic and being you know, a big shot. I'm like, and, and by the way, I wasn't the big shot of, uh, in, in Hollywood's terms, I was like a successful comic. It's still like, you like Howard Stern says, it's still like one step above ham radio operator. It's not like, it's like I'm running around with, uh, Zac Efron or something. So I think at my level, I was just like, dude, I just want to like be home. I want to like sit around with my dogs. I want to not talk show business. I want to work on who I really am and who I was born to be. I think I was just born to be kind of a, I wouldn't say quiet, but kind of like someone who has a lot of alone time, has a lot of family and friend time and likes little things, you know, little, little things in life instead of the big stuff that we think is big, but is actually meaningless. So when I saw meaning not having a place in my life 
And then the minute I retired, having more meaning, I'm like, oh, I'm on to something. And then cutting more and more stuff out just feels right. Like selling a big house that literally I bought because first of all, ego. Second of all, tons of nieces and nephews that could come over, sleep over. Now they're all grown up. And it's like, oh, my ego can withstand letting go of a house and getting one that's probably a quarter of the size and still feeling good about myself and proud. I was looking at your, you posted, you know, your, your house is for sale. And so I was looking at all these pictures of it and you wake up and look out at the ocean on the, on the, on the coast of Connecticut every morning. Will you uh, continue to do that somewhere else? Will you miss that? What's that like? Well, you know, what's funny. I, I'm sitting there right now. It is, that's legit the best part of a Pete. You'll laugh because you know me a little bit. You think I'm sitting here. Okay. It's private beach. It's on the water. Mm -hmm. It's effing baller. Guess what? I have not walked outside on that beach in seven years since I've been here because I hate sand and I hate water. No I way. Bought it. Yeah, I bought it because I love how it looks when you wake up. So I'm like, wait a minute. I love that look. Get a freaking painting in a little house. Cut uh. it out. You know what I mean? It's like it's almost like you go, well, you know, I'll take a vacation once in a while and go to Cape Cod or wherever has the kind of beaches that I like, which is I'm super New Englandy and corny that way. And um. It's funny. I, as long as a house has a lot of light, cause I'm obsessed with like making sure light is good. So I get in a good mood all the time. Sure. I'm like, okay. But yeah, dude, it's funny. Cause I'll miss that part, but you know, I won't settle in a place until it feels really right. So your, a lot of your struggle has been, uh, your personal struggle has been with food and body image. And, but what about, how, how do you, what, how do you categorize it? Uh, in terms of like, what about addiction? What about drugs and alcohol? Yeah. And, and, and where does it all, where does it all start and end for you? Well, I'm really lucky that I never took to drugs or alcohol. I tried pot a bunch of times, you know, and I remember the best pot memories were always with my brother and sister-in-law who, um, when we were in college and stuff like that, and it was just cute. And I just always never liked booze though. And I always had the, this is what a food obsession I had. I would always look at the calories for the booze and go, but I'd rather eat. And I'd get like the, uh, the food coma and the food drunk and all that stuff. So the food was always my addiction. Plus there was the addiction to work and achievement plus the addiction to relationships with guy. So I always had to be in a relationship or whatever. So, um, yeah, it is an addiction foods. As you know, everybody says that the addiction you can't kick cause you have to eat, but yeah, I work on it all the time still. Cause after the weight loss surgery, you know, and keeping most of the weight off, I'm like, geez, I got to get this under control. Cause I don't want to look to food to numb me either. You know, I've actually never, get off. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. I've never, I've actually never heard that. I know it sounds kind of weird, but I've food is a t tough addiction to kick. Cause you have to eat. That is really fascinating. It, may, it doesn't make it a lot harder. It's not like drinking or smoking or doing drugs. Right. But the reason I say, everybody's heard it is because I'm in the circles with all these sure, yentas, yes. with these yentas who complain. I am so sick of the words. It's hard. Guess who had it hard? Um, little girl in an attic in Germany. Her name was Anne Frank. She freaking did it. You know what I mean? Like, so, so I'm like, I just feel like everybody has it hard. Stop saying it's hard. So when these women go, but I get so mm. hard for me to quit food. I'm like, I know, dude, it's hard for You're everybody. You're talking about just having a perspective on on yeah, how much yeah. more difficult, you know, ch life can be if you yeah. can understand what other people are going through. Totally, dude. It's like yeah. having compassion for others and then it leads to compassion for ourselves. It's hard for me to see you and others struggle because uh, with anything, with anything, because, because I know this sounds so terribly stupid and ignorant, but because you have so much money. I think because I've got two daughters and, you know, I just lost my job. Like my only problem in life is financial security. And so I look at you and go, well, you have all the money. So you, what are you worried about? Isn't that like, isn't that so stupid? 
Well, yes, it's really ignorant, but we all have ignorant areas and blind spots. Like I'll look at people who are gorgeous and skinny Mm. naturally, and I'll be like, they're the luckiest, happiest person, I bet. Mm. And it has nothing to do with it. It just has to do with what your own personal demons are, what your own personal journey is. You know, not to be a cliche, um, but look at Anthony Bourdain, Kate Spade, people who kill themselves, who despite having gazillions of dollars, and then you go... Oh my God, it's not about money. It's not about fame. It's not about success. It's like that you lack connection to anything real and that you have mental illness that goes unchecked and things like that. So you realize how dumb you sound. So it's about time you freaking stopped it. Well, there is, there is a certain point though. Like, you know, you want to be able to have enough. Like, I think the, the, the most difficult challenge for me and a lot of other people is when losing your job and losing your health insurance like that that sucks like yeah, you want to be, especially when it's yes. not just you you I mean you have my two daughters yes. and it's like that's a stupid thing about america like you shouldn't lose your access to affordable health insurance health care if you lose your job that's just the uniquely american stu- stupidity but it, it is ridiculous no it's ridiculous and also it's um it sucks and is not fair And you go, well, what am I supposed to learn about this? What is my resilience practice? Like, how do I make this work without getting bitter and tied up in it? You know, how do I learn how to deal with it? But it's hard. I, there's, I guarantee I'd rather be in a different position than the one you're in. That's a hard, you're in something hard right now, but it, you know what they say, do you have enough food for today? Do you have enough um, shelter over your head? Do you have enough, somebody you could stay with if you have to, I mean, All these things, you know, we're not, we're only as strong as our challenges force us to be. And I guarantee you, you're going to survive. Like, there's no freaking way. You're too funny, smart, insightful, and you've got this good work ethic. Nope. You ain't going to be homeless. Calm down. What what is your resilience practice? Uh, Just every day, literally going, it's definitely happening for a reason. And I totally, there's a lesson in it. Knowing that every single thing has a lesson, at least in my life, I'm like, okay, I had to go through that in order to um, come back from it and learn a lesson. Like, for instance, okay, uh, say I was really sad when my book came out years ago and it didn't be on the bestseller list. It felt so crushing. It felt like I was a loser and a Mm. moron and I had nothing going on and I'm nobody And it's like, I had to go through that. What was the lesson in it? To stop judging yourself by other people's standards. Stop. You're more than just a number. So in other words, you could take any failure, quote unquote, and go, if I have a lesson in it, then I'm clearly a huge success. Like this year, I've tried like two careers that I didn't like. And like you said before, self-compassion. Thank God I tried them because I learned what I do and I don't like. By taking that play that I did. Yeah. I learned, first of all, I'm kind of proud of myself in one way because I know I'm like a really good actor. Like I I had, I was coached every day by a Yale school of drama guy. Like I just, am a when I want to do something good, I like go for it. I learned, well, I, that appeared to be a failure, quote unquote, because I didn't like it. Well, what did I learn? I like collaborating. I don't like having a director. I like to make call the shots myself. Mm. I like working with a group of people who take things seriously, who are still nice. I learned I don't like rehearsal every day. So I learned like all these lessons and I'm like, oh, I'll just keep figuring out the lesson in it. They keep popping up. So if we look at what's the lesson in you losing that job, that's a resilience thing of like, okay, let me see what I'm really supposed to learn. And you can't force it. It's just going to come up. Maybe it's to teach you that your life isn't about taking care of everyone and carrying the whole ball yourself and asking for help and receiving instead of giving, you know, so we just have to be open to all that, that, that stuff. What's I, I'm, like, What's I'm like, thank God, uh, thank God, because I, I wouldn't know how to keep moving forward without it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What's the other job that you did that you didn't like? I hated individual coaching. You did. I hated it. I like group coaching. That was really fun because the group dynamic is cool. And I love giving workshops, group, individual coaching. I wanted to punch every single one of my clients in the face because I have <laughs> too much. I want them to improve at my rate, which oh. is clearly not my job. 
rather than their rate. I'm like, why didn't you do that yet? What's going on? Hold yourself accountable. So I, that, that no nonsense approach really doesn't have a place in coaching. It's kind of like for advice giving or motivational speaking or groups or whatever. But I laughed because I go every time I looked at my calendar and there was this full list of people I had a call, I'd want to just like jump out the window because I was like, I don't hate these individuals. I hate how I feel when I get off the phone and they haven't gone forward. So I go, well, this isn't for me, at least at this point. But I'm glad I did it because now I'm a better coach when after the storytelling shows, people have this, um, we have this big Q&A about big issues. I'm a better coach. So I'm like, okay, I was supposed to do that. So tell me about, yeah, tell me about the, tell me about losing it. Yeah, no, it's really, I like it a lot. Uh, Again, it's a storytelling show, much like The Moth, if people have seen The Moth. Um, It's me and three other actors slash comedians talking about, uh, telling stories about food and weight image, excuse me, food and body image stuff. And just um, what I like is I still get that little humor and personal appearance hit that I can still be funny and bring that gift but it doesn't have to not have a message because in cell comedy, I didn't really feel I had a message. So it felt meaningless towards the end. Hmm. But now I'm like, Oh, it has a little meaning. They get to walk out and feel better about themselves or feel like they're not alone or they're not in the struggle, even though we just fooled them into learning something with laughter. So I think like if it was all serious, that's fine, but that's not me. I think dude, everything I do, including like you, I'm sure everything you do is going to have some element of laughter just because you're smart does and have a message doesn't mean it's not going to be funny. So, um, I love the show and it's, we're doing it all over the country in the first six months. And then who the hell knows what happens. I may just like sell my house and live in a little cottage with my two dogs and call your dopey show once in a while. Lisa Lampanelli.com for all the dates. And I'd be welcome to that. You know, my weird thing, you're probably going to, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this before, but it, it, it probably always sounds foreign to, to, to most people since my depression which is you know, entirely related to my job loss began. I, st- I stopped, I lost 15 pounds, which, you know, I don't have to lose. Wow. Right. Right. Be- because I think, I think I, I never really have had had a strong relationship with food, but I, at some points I think I just felt like no desire to eat. And I think maybe at the, at the worst points, and this is not only with food, but it's with my wife. It's with other things I like. I felt I don't deserve to eat. I don't deserve to have the good things that I have achieved, which I know is stupid and unhealthy and sick, but that's, that's how my depression manifested that I didn't, I didn't I don't deserve to eat. I lost 15 pounds. I I look like a a survivor of a, of a genocide. Yeah, that's not, it's funny because it's not funny. It's not fun. People are like, oh, I wish I was depressed that way. It's right. Like, freaking idiot. You just want to go, could you be more ignorant? And <laughs> yeah, that is definitely. But I think what's good is you recognize it. I would, I would try to maybe fix the language you're using, which is like, it's, I know it's stupid and I know it's you know dumb or whatever. No, it's not. It's not stupid or dumb. It like makes a lot of sense. You're really struggling with something and it's great because by hearing that, it, it'll help other people go, oh, my God, I have that thing, too. So I think if you recognize that it's not a stupid thing, that it, your feelings are your feelings, that this is how it manifested itself and you can self-correct, you've learned something. Is- um, it just it just sucks that this is going on for you. But again, at the end of all this, you're going to go, oh, my God, I learned this because of what I went through. Kelly Carlin told me that I'm on a ship in a storm and I can't see any land. And that was the yeah. best way that someone put it because a lot of people have said what, what you've said is at the end, when you come out of it right. that, that, and, I, and I go, I, there is no end. I'm not going to come out of it. This is it. This is where I'm going to be the rest of my life. I had the best right. gig in the world. It was awesome. I was the happiest guy in the world. I, I was so rewarded that I could help other people with what I was doing and uh, it's over. It's over for me. And it will always be over for me. Well, you want to know the great thing? I didn't think what you were doing was that great. So <laughs> no, I joke. I joke. Of course, I didn't listen. <laughs> anyway, no, I know. But you're right that, that the light at the end of the tunnel thing, if you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's harder to have that. This too shall pass mentality. But just know that this too shall pass because think about it. How old are you? 40 yet? 44. Okay. 
you've lived 44 years. You're still here. You're still alive. You've gone through other heartaches and hard times. You're still on earth. You've still gotten through it. So you go, oh, those did pass. I can't see the end in sight on this one. But chances are a logical mind goes, if I got through that other stuff, I bet I can do this, but it's going to suck for a long time. Just realizing with compassion for yourself that it's going to suck for a while makes you feel better. Like I know, dude, I was in huge despair in, I think, September because I just started with this new therapist going Mm -hmm. through brief stuff and just really examining what I medicate with achievement wise. This is how all this stuff came out. And I was at Elvis Duran's wedding. I don't go to like a lot of celebrity things, but I was like, oh, that's so kind that he invited me. And I was so exhausted emotionally because it hit you physically too. Like, you know, I said to my manager who was my date, because that's how popular I am. I had to hoodwink my manager into going. I was like, dude, I have no energy. We can go to the wedding for maybe two hours, but nothing else the whole weekend. So I, at that point, in September, couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I go, I'm going to be in this forever. So I'm exactly where you were, right? Dude, I'm not saying I'm in the greatest place in the world. Oh my God, I have it all figured out. It's going to take years. But what's good is I go, oh my God, I am connecting better with people. Oh, I'm less depressed. Oh, I I had a good time last night. Oh, so-and-so and I had a meaningful conversation. Oh, I love my dogs, whatever you get these little glimmers. So I think if you just recognize you've gotten through things in the past and it didn't kill you, this won't kill you either, but you got to keep that steady yeah, course. Unfortunately, Recognizing <laughs> sounds like you are practicing this kind of gratefulness for the, the, the many things that you do have that you love your dogs, your, your family. Yeah. And, and that's that uh, gratitude is an abr- abracadabra. It like literally mm. is magic. And I hate to be like gratitude practice. Cause I think that's gay as fuck. Like I hate gratitude <laughs> journal or whatever, whatever works though. Well, I like for that. People. What I like is I've been doing going, that. My wife told yeah. me to do that. I like it. Well, it's good. Cause you're a pussy whip guy. And I like that about you. Oh, she's so, so wise. Hey, what, she is. Remember when you were me and you would have conversations about her and you were upset or whatever, this or that. Does she love me? This, that you got through that. Yeah. When Look we were, that. when I was working with you on the road, I mean, I was in your car complaining like and whining. And we, we had just started dating my wife and I now wife and I. And so, uh, you know, what's interesting though. And I haven't said this publicly, but my relationship for our entire, most of our marriage, like I didn't need her for her life experience and for her wisdom and my wife has suffered every type of abuse and every kind of adversity. So now that I'm experiencing my first real suffering and, 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 and anxiety and depression, which I'd only heard about and tried to help other people with, but couldn't because I'd never dealt with it. My wife's yeah. like, hold my beer, dude. And she is my guide, my teacher. Oh. And it, I've never loved her. I've more. I've never needed her more. It's been a, an ama- like the best thing that happened in my marriage was losing my job. You know what? Think about that. I do. And remember that every day and write it down 50 times a day. Cause guess what? You need to practice receiving. You're the guy who takes care, takes care, takes care. And no one takes care of you because you don't allow it. It's not like she didn't want to do it in the past. You just didn't allow it. Cause you're the guy and you're just probably, I don't know your parents or whatever, but you were probably, you know, got emotional hits from taking care of people in the past or whatever. Huge. And it's like, oh, this is great. Now you can actually practice what you need to have in life is receiving also. And then there's going to be balance in that. So look at this. Do you see one of the lessons already? So lean into it. Mm. Enjoy the fact that, oh my God, I'm not alone. And I've got somebody's help who knows more than me about this part of this journey. I love it. I feel bad though, because she has to peel me off the ground like a couple times a week. So what? You used to have to do that for her. You used to have to do that for your kids. You used to have to do that for other people, your folks, you know, other friends. Guess what? Now is your time. It's not to say abuse it and wallow in it, but don't be so hard on yourself. You're, you're too hard on yourself. You have to have that compassion for yourself because you did nothing wrong other than having a radio show that was so bad they took it off the air. Jeffrey Tambor said to me the second time he was on my show, he, Stop bragging. he at the very beginning, 
of the the interview, he said, oh, I, I thought they'd let you go. And I go, no, it, the show's going great. I, I just created this channel. Why would you think that? And he said, oh, because the show's not good. Oh, my God. I'm so happy I'm not the first to tell you that because it's terrible. So and God, no, I'm just kidding. It was actually really good. And but there's something the universe did you some kind of favor mm. by getting rid of that. There's some learning here that you're going to someday. And I know it's annoying, but it will happen someday. You will be like, oh, my God, best thing that ever happened to me. Will thank it, God. Will it come with a 401k? Probably so, because you'll have some other opportunity that will. So for like all this positivity and all this evolution in your life and all these amazing experiences that you you've had, but I mean, so much struggle and so much adversity as well that, that I think, you know, for you, for the people who know you and the people you've helped, it's, it, it's been good because they can relate, you can relate to them. But it, it, I, the one thing I really wonder about, cause I never hear you talking about any kind of specific practice that I've heard of or any kind yeah, of guru no, or any right. kind of specific guru. I mean, you say certain things that I've kind of heard and can relate to, but is there a Buddhism? Is there a Tony nope. Robbins? Is there, nope. I mean, it, it, Nope, Nope. Don't need it. I just take it, pick and choose like this weekend. I'm going to Kripalu, which uh, I taught a workshop there on food and body image, but I go there for different, like if topics come up that sound like they, um, will help me or I can learn from, I go, Oh, I'm going to go up there for like a weekend of relaxation and learning. So I take bits and pieces. So I'll take a little bit from, uh, Bernie Brown, little from Cheryl Strait, little from Glennon Doyle, Melton, uh, um, a little bit from, uh, different teachers at Kripalu and just go, Oh, that's, that's good. That works for me. So no, there's never like, I'm really into dot, dot, dot. Like, I don't do it as a fad or like, mm -hmm. it's just, I cobbled together this little way of living that works. And I, yeah, the so, minute I, I, the minute I get a guru type thing, I think I would be again, achieve that, that you're, uh, you're doing it right. So I don't do anything right. Do you think, so what, what do you have to say then about, um, dieting? It's a billion dollar industry it's diets terrible. and dieting. It's, it's literally the worst thing that ever happened to food and bodies because no food is bad food. Everything should be in balance. Everything should be in some sort of not moderation, but in balance of like, Oh, I had dessert. So what if the people judge themselves by what they eat and it's horrible, I think the diet industry is evil. I think it's convincing us we're not enough. I'm so proud of all these big girls who have positivity and big men who have body positivity, even at, any size, because I'm like, oh, if I'd have had that dude, if I had grown up when it was okay to be fat, I would have never gotten weight loss surgery and been like, have the tiniest stomach in the world that I can hardly eat anything now. So, I mean, I'm glad I did it, I guess, because I look like I want to look to from the neck down, but it's like, you know, boy, it's a shame I couldn't feel good about myself like some of these women and men out there. So yeah, dieting, I think it's just evil and show, telling us we're not good enough. So if you had it to do over again, you wouldn't have got the, uh, the stomach stable surgery uh, and, and, you no, don't, I, and you don't recommend yes, it? Did. No, no, no. I would get it. Okay. But because I had to go through that, mm. I didn't have, I wasn't raised body positive. We didn't, that didn't exist in the seventies. So when you're growing up, you have the messages of thin is the best. I wish if my life was perfect, that I had been born later, that I had gotten into body positivity and liked myself the way I was. That couldn't happen because I didn't, I wasn't born a few years ago, but I, for my, um, physicality, I guess I had to do it. And for my journey. So at least I can help others go. It's a great operation to save your life. It's a phenomenally underused surgery. Um, to bring down all your vitals. If you have a huge morbidly obese, um, uh, if you're morbidly obese and have the lifestyle that you can't do it yourself, I totally uh, approve of it, but I just wish I didn't have to go through it. What do you make or where, what side do you fall down on the, uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but like the, the Bill Maher, James Corden fight where Bill Maher basically made the point about, you know, against this kind of body positivity idea, because I guess he was saying, that, you know, being overweight is, is also, you know, you can, it, it can kill you. It can be really unhealthy. And that, that's a, not, but that's not what he was saying. He was, I don't doing remember what he, said. he was, no, no, I'm sorry. It's not your, 
fault. That might have been like the re- that rebrand. You know, yeah. That's okay. He was just, it was a really great excuse to do a bunch of really funny fat jokes, which I can totally appreciate because mm-hmm. some of the funniest jokes were jokes at my own or other people's expense. So I get it. It was ignorant as fuck, but it was, it was literally just wrong. It wasn't true. It was, and James Corden was hundred percent right. And the thing is, I'm the biggest fan of Bill Maher. I am in mourning right now because the show isn't on right now. Mm. Like I, every Friday, that's my show. Did you see so me I'm on the, it? Uh, no, I, that's I, I did bullshit. not. Bullshit. When, when was that? March, How long ago was that? March, 2018. Moving on. So I'll send you the clip. So, but what yeah, about, so, what, what about the idea that it is um, unhealthy to be but overweight? It's nobody's, but it's nobody's, but it's nobody's business. It's literally like you choose and you are like who you are. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like it kind of got an answer to the person in the mirror. Like, I wish I could have looked in the mirror at, you know, 248 pounds and gone, you're fine. Cause there's people who are 600 who say they're fine. Hmm. That's up to them. Do I think they should lose weight for health? Probably. But why, what, who the hell am I to say hmm. that's their journey because they have to go through what they have to go through. I'm glad I got the surgery because, again, it took it off the self-hate and depression off the table about that issue. But then it popped up on other places. And that's what I'm working on now. So the the body, the body you want doesn't fix the the emotions that you've been stuffing. How often do you think about or what are your thoughts about living in the past? When I think about your career and everything that you accomplished Selling out theaters, so many appearances on Howard Stern show, the Comedy Central roasts. I mean, I mean, you probably have a lot of friends who are really famous or you could if you had wanted to cultivate those relationships. Like, do you do you think about the past? Do you go through the highlights and think about? No, those? no, I never do it because I it's done and I don't it's weird because I don't care. Like, it's just like it was like having a job, like literally it's no it was no better than having just a job that was fun. Cause like, okay, for instance, here's an example. When I did radio city, the only thing I remember about that day was that my parents came in and we had dinner and I have the picture up upstairs that my mother framed from us at dinner. And I'm like, that was the whole best part. And so I, that's, that helps you retire. Cause you go, Oh my God, did it. all my memories are about when my nephews came to see me or when friends came to see me or when I actually connected with friends and family over this art form. I'm like, wow, cool. I can actually retire and not miss any of that. So your relationship with ego is what? Um, diminishing all the time now oh. that I'm not taking stuff from right. for achievement's sake. Yes. Uh, do I still work on it? And do I like, like, for instance, I posted something. We had a game night the other night and I posted something on Instagram just because it's, I actually legitimately post things just so my nieces and nephews will see it and go know that I used the games they gave me or the gifts they gave me and stuff. But the part of me was like, wow, 64, 6,518 hits or whatever it was. Cool. But then I go, but that's a temporary ego hit for a second. Those people don't really like you except the ones that are friends and family. So cut it out. Like I'm able to grab it really fast. I have a bigger ego over, which I have to work on too, over oh, I made a great Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner. And mm. oh, did they like it better than like last year? So I got to keep that in check. You're fine either way. We just have to keep telling ourselves, which is true, that we're fine either way. We'll live. So you're not going to promote your appearance on this podcast on social media? I will to help you because I am a nice person, but this does nothing for me with your three listeners. Oh, great. I love you. No, so I will post this because it is helpful to you. I think, I don't know. I don't know how podcasting works. Cause my podcast, I did it for like two months and then I was like, Oh my God, kill me. So it's just too much work. I love uh, doing your podcast. That was really fun. I enjoyed it. You were great. You were great. You were deep. You're not going to talk- continue with that. No, because guess what? We had 10,000 downloads, I think a week, which I guess is good, but not good enough for podcast one to continue financing it. So I would have had to find somebody to edit it. And I'm like, it's no fun if I have to do all that. So I'm like, no, thanks. No, thanks. Again, ego had to take a back seat and go, it it hurt my feelings a little and then go, yeah, but it wasn't meant to be. So I like learning that failure is really literally a success. It sounds like a buzzwordy thing to say, but dude, you asked me if I miss 
anything that I'm not doing anymore, I would be like, absolutely not. Unless it was maybe somebody died or, <clears throat> right. you know, if somebody died or I didn't have a chance to do this or whatever. What do you do when you wake up in the morning? Um, I usually, the first thing I do is let my alarm play the whole through because it's the Brady Bunch singing when it's time to change, when Peter Brady's voice changes. So I let my alarm play the whole through way through and I like, like sing it to my dogs and we crack up, meaning I crack up because they couldn't care less because they're assholes. So <laughs> I do that. And then I go, let me see if I have any emails. And I'm like, oh my God, that's cute. Oh my God, that's cute. I'm going to ignore that one till I'm awake. Um, and then I just kind of like go, do I want coffee? Do I want to take my vitamins? Like I just literally don't have a schedule unless there's something I have to do, like fly out or whatever. But I, I don't force anything. I have breakfast once or twice a week with really good friends. Oh, that's another thing I did, dude. I, I, I cut out acquaintances. I can't. What do you, I, I was going to ask I you. I cannot with acquaintances. What is, what is an acquaintance? Someone I can't have a soulful conversation with. You, I consider, even though I never see you and we don't talk, I consider you more of a friend than I consider people I used to see weekly or, or every day because we can talk on a different level. You speak, quote unquote, the language. So that's because you work on yourself and you have that kind of level of understanding. There are people that I had in my life out of scarcity. Again, a way to achieve is have a lot of friends. It's like scarcity was driving me to collect friends. And then it was like, I got to get rid of these fuckers because they are making me depressed. The, the, every time I leave, I feel emptier than when I went into this coffee date or whatever. And I, I, with honor, started getting rid of people and calling them and telling them, look, I just, I'm not going to ghost you. I feel bad that you've texted twice, but I, we need to be brave and talk about why we can't be friends anymore. Really? And it, you did that? Dude, it was, I was the proudest person in the world. I was so proud of myself. And that, I go, is, that is so fucking impressive. Well, I've, been, I've, been, I've, been I've, I've been ghosted. And I've been ghosted. I've been ghosted. You're like, what happened? Fact, oh my God. Matter it's, of fact, somebody ghosted me this week, this year. And I didn't get the hint. Cause I was like, I'm so not used to that. Like, I'm just like, who would ghost I thought you? They, I'm just a, a friend who didn't want to be friends with me anymore, I guess. And I was like, I finally got the message. Like, holy crap. They don't like me. And that's all right. I'm not for everybody. They're not for everybody. Nobody's for everybody. And then I started noticing the friends around me who I was just like, I dread their call or I dread getting together with them. Mm. So I scheduled a phone call with one of them. It was honest. It was hard. It was, she was upset because they, they don't see it coming because they don't know you've outgrown them. It's not their fault. They didn't do anything wrong. And I tried to impress you did nothing wrong. It just doesn't serve us anymore. And I felt that it was very honorable. I mean, so, it's, beyond, it's so honorable. It's so challenging. I've never done that. And oh, my, my shrink literally gave me a standing ovation. She was like, I've never heard anybody. I was going to say, did your shrink give you the idea, the advice to do it? No, but she, that's why she doesn't advice give. That's why she's a good shrink. Mm. She said to me after though, this was really funny. Uh, afterwards she goes, yeah, she goes, you don't know how many times I just wanted to shake you and go, are you going to fucking get rid of her already? And it was so funny because I was like, she's not, that's a good shrink doesn't do that. Right. So I'm like, dude, I mean, it was great. I was so happy. Yeah, that that's, that's so, that is so honorable and that is so mature and very few people, I guess, I want to say have the con the confidence in, in themselves because it's yeah. because you feel like you're hurting somebody. You uh, you right. feel you feel like you're letting somebody down, especially you probably because people probably have a lot of stake and in, in investment in being your friend because of who you are and what you've accomplished and what you have and blah blah blah. Well, I'm lucky cuz uh there's a few friends who I see that come and I was like didn't even engage. I that was kept at like surfacey social media friendships and stuff. But the ones that I just had to like really cut out, it just, it was my, my shrink always says everyone wants to get to heaven. You, they just don't want to go through hell to get there. Mm. So it feels like heaven to not have surface people and acquaintances in my life and just deep friendships and not wasting any time. I mean, she always goes, we only have three things that we have. We can't manufacture time, money, and energy and how you spend yours is up to you. So if you're looking at your calendar at a coffee date or a dinner date and want to throw up, 
why, what are you doing? People pleaser. And I'm like, yeah, we got to get rid of these people. And it wasn't fun and cute and it wasn't um, happy, but it was something to be proud of. It was like a baller move. Oh, it absolutely is. So what, who are you? You mentioned them, I guess, this kind of being more acquaintances. So how many and what type of people uh, do you have in your life that that you do value that you do think, I guess, uh, bring you positivity and that you and look forward to seeing and talking to? Like how many and what is the depth yeah. of those? What yeah, see, of those? I, I had a lot of um, surface friendships, but now it's only people who can speak like this. So one is one of my best friends, Jane in Westport. Another one, one of my best friends, Emily in Fairfield. There's my best friend of 32 years, Vicki, who's in, also in Connecticut. There's one of my good friends, believe it or not. I met her one weekend at Kripalu, like almost five years ago. And we talk like almost every day. Mm. She's, I, I never see her. She's in Vermont. And it's just like, we even said yesterday, we're cracking up going, how the hell did this even happen? And it's, it's just like meant to be, um, I, there's a few outlying ones that I don't see or talk to often, but that I go, oh, they're soulmates. Like my friend Frank uh, Liotti, who's uh, in my storytelling show, I could talk, talk deeply with. Um, a girl who helped me write my play, Ashley Austin Morris, is a comic. She, I could talk deeply with her. Um, believe it or not, my nephew's wife speaks the language and gets me and looked me in the eyes on Christmas. And, you know, when family, it's all rushed, you know? She actually just goes to me and she's young. She's in her late twenties. She goes, so how are you doing? And I felt so seen. Uh, I go, she speaks the language. Yeah. She knows how to make people yeah. feel good by working on themselves. So yeah, it's like a smaller group. Like I would say maybe 10 people, but, and one's somebody I met at a workshop and she's in Vancouver and you go, wow, that's a lot of people who I can really yeah. soul connect with. How lucky am I? But I was see people, what I was doing was gathering um, surface people out of scarcity, but it didn't work anyway right. because you end up feeling empty and alone. I now have this, like, oh, uh, my goodness. Go ahead. An old friend of mine who I used to hang out with in New York, he was a singer and a, and a Broadway guy and he lives in Australia and he's, yeah. a, he's a big deal. His name is David Campbell. I don't mind uh, mentioning. He listens to the show now and he introduced me to this app called Marco Polo. Have you ever heard of it? No, it's just videos like you, I make a video and then he watches it and, and then he corresponds. So you're not like in a in an exchange like we are now on the phone and and we do it. We've done it almost every day. And since I lost my gig and before that, we we rarely talked except by text. We just kept up. Now we talk every day. And this guy, David Campbell, has been. Like, I'm going to start crying even talking about him. He's been yeah, my he's, saving grace. Right. Yep. He's but one of your angels. Definitely. A, yeah, for sure. My wife and him and, you know, a whole bunch of other people. Uh, the, you know, the, the best part about my gig was the networker created real people that have been amazing. But I do worry about the and he he, he dresses me down every time I, I bring this up. I do worry about the imbalance with my wife, with him, with other people. It's like, I'm sitting here griping all the time and being negative. How much of this can you take before you dump me? I'll tell you what, if you look at the course of your marriage, take her, for instance, it's probably evening out now. So in other words, you probably were, say you were 90% support in the past. Well, she's 90 now. So it all evens out. And by the way, it's their job to say, this is getting too much. You need professional help. That's their job. And your job is to say, I need professional help. I can't be a burden, but right. I can receive. You're the one who has to walk the line between burden and receiving. My friend Vicki, who I know for 32 years, like she's disabled and she really is spiritual as fuck. And I, sometimes I go, God almighty, I'm really putting upon her because she, you know, has a lot of physical pain. Should I be asking her? She always says it's my job to not answer the phone if I can't pick it up. Mm. And I'm like, you're right. It's and and yes, of course, if it's an SOS, she'll like go through pain or whatever to get to the phone. But, you know, that's their job. Your wife's job is to be honest and not be codependent about it. So, again, we're all learning these balancing tools. So, you don't like yourself enough to think you're worth sticking around for. 
pretty soon you'll see you're worth sticking around for. Why would you be friends with a disabled person? Um, why? Um, 32 years of history uh, when she wasn't. And then she had all these accidents. And why would you dump a disabled person? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that you were making a joke i was and you didn't even hear it which is and bizarre this is like and this is literally why you're not a comic anymore because you know, <laughs> cause your jokes land like a fucking sack of lead uh no i mean uh, i i would imagine what i was actually thinking was wow i bet you she gives her you know anybody with any type of physical struggle like that gives you a, a, com- a completely different perspective on your own Totally, because you actually, she's like, she's all into like, your pain is your pain. Like, she doesn't consider her pain worse than mine. Like, because she's like, yeah, these things have happened to me. But you know what? You have it hard, too. And she always is like, we are struggling. And I freaking love that she isn't a victim. That's what I can't be friends with. And those are the people I've dumped, by the way, victims. And it's people, you're not a victim. Victims are. No, I haven't, who, yeah, I haven't felt that. I haven't felt bad for myself. No, I, I'm that's frustrated. The I'm not angry and I don't feel like yeah. a victim. And I, well, I'm just. Why, well, that's why your wife and this guy aren't going to get sick of you because you're not a victim. That's what we get sick of. Mm. Of like, well, me? poor me. Right. I don't know. What did I do wrong? I was just like, everything happens to me. Oh, shut the fuck up with you. It's like, dude, I want to change. I, well, I'm sad. You're allowed to be sad. That's the whole thing with sick. I had a major grief attack over the holidays because I was sad over different dreams that didn't come true or death of a dream of the perfect family when I was a kid or whatever, or my dad dying or a relationship not working. And I'm like, I just had to go through it. So you're fine. You're just gonna get through it if you feel your feelings and allow yourself to be sad. So this is an hour. I'm going to let you go, but not before, before I play this for you. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Time to change the Brady Bunch. Parker. My dogs, my dogs literally both just jumped up. Why this song? It's okay. It's silly. You but wake really up to the this words, song. The words are pretty. It's it's okay. It's pretty profound words for as goofy as it is. Listen, when it's time to change, then it's time to change. Don't fight the tide, go along for the ride. Don't you see? When it's time to change, you've got to rearrange. Who's in your heart into what you're gonna be? Yay! Lisa Lampanelli, I have loved you and admired you <laughs> since the moment I met you, and I cannot thank um, you enough for joining me today. I love you, dude, and I'm going to say this. You are a gentleman, and if you're ever in crisis, you can call me anytime. I consider you a friend. I'll call you in an hour. I love you, pal. Bye, Lise. Bye, buddy. <laughs> His voice is changing. Well, how about that? Isn't she awesome? That was fun and enlightening and motivating and inspiring. I hope you liked that one. I certainly did. Lisa Lampanelli. Check her out. See her storytelling. LisaLampanelli.com. Losing it. Look up everything she's ever done. I hope you have people like her in your life. That's all for today. On Friday, the Fonz, Henry Winkler, will join me right here on the podcast. Subscribe on Patreon, patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Give me a rating and subscribe wherever you subscribe to podcasts. January 18th, Charleston, South Carolina. That's my last plug. That's where I'll be performing, headlining the Charleston Comedy Festival. Thanks for listening. Take us out, Brady Bunch. <laughs>